All right, happy Tuesday to everybody who is watching uh, this uh, Museums from Your Home live stream. We're gonna take a few seconds to verify that all the locations we are streaming to are in fact streaming properly like they are supposed to. Hadn't failed us yet, uh, but because I like to make sure that things working well. All right, so it looks like we're good on the Gorgas House. Facebook page. You can watch from the Gorgas House Facebook page as well as the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum Facebook page. And you can also watch this from the UA Museum's YouTube channel. And uh, it looks like everything is working and good to go. And uh, just a reminder, if you're watching, you can feel free to ask anybody on the panel today some questions or uh, leave some comments if you feel like you want to contribute to the conversation. All right. Well, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. and. Uh, We'll uh, kick off this uh, live stream. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the Communication Specialist for UA Museums. And joining me today are Catherine Edge, the Director of the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum and Brandon Thompson, Director of the Gorgas House Museum. And we have a guest today. Uh, Catherine, would you like to introduce her? Yes, I would be, um, I'd absolutely be thrilled to. So um, I'm, I've been excited about all of the guests that we've had so far, but I'm particularly excited about this guest because this is one of my um, this is one of my friends from graduate school. Um, we are honored today to have Mary Compton with us. She is the advisor to the Memorial Student Center Visual Arts Committee at Texas A&M, and um, so she works a lot um, works with students to curate a professional art gallery um, at Texas A&M. And um, like I said, Mary and I met in graduate school, and uh, and now and now we are colleagues so it is an it is an honor to have uh to have you with us here today mary thank you so much for joining us no oh, thank you so much for inviting me yeah well, it's cool to see that. no go uh, ahead, <laughs> i was about to say it's cool to see that gallery in the background so uh thank you for joining us uh, i'll just throw out a quick reminder before we get into our discussion uh while we're broadcasting here on facebook and youtube feel free to ask these uh panelists any questions you might have and leave some comments in the comment section and uh, remember, this is live, so anything can happen. So just hang in there in case we have any issues. Uh, so now that we've gotten some of that sort of business out of the way, uh, how should we get started today? Well, um, again, Mary, Mary's joining us from Texas A&M, and um, it looks like she, um, it looks like you're in your gallery. Mary, is that is that accurate? Are you coming to us from your gallery there in um, there in Texas? Yes. So this is the Reynolds Gallery at Texas A&M. We are located in the Memorial Student Center, which on other campuses that might be similar to your student union. Um, we are actually one of three galleries in this building and the Reynolds Gallery is curated by the Visual Arts Committee students. So this is the student gallery on our campus. Very nice. Or, so right um, on display is actually from our annual juried show. So these are all student pieces behind me. We're in the process of taking them to the trying to get them back to students. And I guess that's been a little bit more complicated here recently with um, with everything everything going on. So, um, but um, just uh, what what exactly? Um, just share with everybody what what's your background and how did you come into this position? So I actually did my bachelor's degree at Texas A and M. So I had some familiarity with the school, the traditions, uh, what the art scene was like before I applied for the job. Uh, which was pretty fortunate, I think. Um, I started, as you you know very well, we went to grad school together at the University of Leicester. And after I graduated, I entered the workforce and started working with museums in any capacity that I could. So I did a lot of like entry positions. I did a lot of internships. I did a lot of volunteering and any kind of small regional museum that I could get my hands in, I was trying to do as much as I could early in my career. So in about 2010, I moved back to the United States and I got a job with the San Antonio Children's Museum in their education team. So really that's when I started working with Gen Z's because they were kids in the museum at that age. And I've kind of stayed with them throughout the process of their maturation. So um, working with young Gen Z's at the time, I was working in doing science and art delivery. I was working primarily with their schools in field trip programming. So doing outreach to teachers and recruiting new field trips and promoting our programs. 
Um, I After that, I took a job briefly in development and fundraising where I was doing special event planning. And that was with the youth orchestras of San Antonio. Um, again, uh, Gen Z students that I was serving and working with. And um, I was only there for about a year because I just was not keen on development. And I applied for this job immediately after that. So this job I started in 2015. So it's been five going on six years since I was here at Texas A&M. Well, that is that that's fantastic. Um, I had I I had no idea that you were you you actually had so much experience over several positions with this particular age group. That's um that's incredibly that's incredibly interesting. Um, I guess to speak more more specifically about the Reynolds Gallery and and what you do there at Texas A and M. Um, so. What is, and I, I think this is something that um, that I know I, I struggle with, um, and uh, perhaps Brandon does too. But what method do you, of contact do you use to reach students to be involved with the gallery? Because there there are obviously so many ways now to, um, you know, for all of us to be connected. You know, what is the what is the best way that you've found um, to reach to reach Gen Z? Because I'm personally very very curious about that. Uh, you're asking specifically about like the technology, like what what platform? Yeah, you can yeah use but yeah, your your I guess preferred method of contact where you've had the most success. Right. So right now, with my visual arts students, we are using GroupMe quite a bit. That's what they prefer. With my and that's for like the general membership for the broad group of students. But with my student leaders, we're using something called Slack. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it has different channels where you can keep your conversations kind of separate. It lets you do direct messaging. It's very efficient. Um, it's a little take. It takes a little getting used to, even for the Gen Z students. I had some students who just didn't adapt to it right away, but it does uh, kind of facilitate a lot more conversation. I feel. Hmm. So a lot of texting, a lot of group messaging. Um, I could keep up with some of my former students. I, I do have former students who I connect with on Instagram and Facebook. So a lot of social media connections with them. Have and we have, um, yeah, we have a question. Uh, James is asking, can we define who makes up Gen Z? That is, that's a great question. So um, can you, um, can you answer, answer that for us? Well, I have a whole presentation on that. Do we want to jump into that, or do you yeah, want me to? That's, no, go for it. Yeah, that, that can yeah that question? can help us. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Go for it. Awesome. It looks like Rebecca's giving me permission to share the screen, or is that? Are you guys seeing the screen? Yeah, I'm trying to pull it up. Uh, it's got the uh, the black screen though. Let's see if we can uh, try to refresh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think we we might have lost Mary there while we were trying to do that. Um, I guess uh, while we wait on her to uh, pop back in, um, uh, how how would you all maybe define Gen Z? Brandon, do you want to go? You want to speak first? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Um, I think it has to do based on the year in which they were born and kind of what their social cultural implications might be and what their their feelings of the cultural current status is, but I think Mary's back, so she can probably answer a little bit more specifically than I can. Yeah. All right, let's see uh, maybe if we can. So I've to... lost my screen, but that's oh, okay. Uh, okay. If you can get it. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, pull that up on my end. Uh, but yeah, we were just talking okay. about how maybe we could try to uh, uh, define Gen Z. Let's see. Definition I'm using is like Brandon was saying, it's really based on the year that Gen Zs were born. So, and if you're looking at the order of generations, there is um, there's typically like a 16 year period where we define new generations. So before Gen Zs, we had millennials. Before millennials, we had Gen X. Before Gen X, we had baby boomers. So when we're looking at Gen Z, we're typically looking at the ages between, well, born between 1997 and about 2012. Um, I typically use the, a, a year that's a little earlier. There's a researcher named Corey C. Miller who, oh, I see we're back up. Awesome. Am I sharing? Yes, 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 I see it. It's a great chart. Okay. 
Okay. So, okay. Well, I can't take credit for the chart. This actually came from Pew Research Center. And um, so Gen Z is we're looking at ages born between 1997 and 2012. And the that puts them at the, the um, the oldest of the that gen demographic right now is about 25 years old, and the youngest is maybe about six or seven. And I was saying I use a little earlier year. I use 1995 as the start date because that's the date that researcher Corey C. Miller uses, and I just use a lot of her uh, research to inform what I know about Gen Zs and sort of what I've seen myself. So when I started working with Gen Z here at Texas A&M in 2015, I was getting some of those older Gen Zs through my doors, like entering college at that 18, 19 year old age. So I was gonna talk about who is Gen Z defining sort of what the typical characteristics of this demographic are, talking about their Z values, Z strengths, Z concerns, and then um, we're probably going to get into discussion about how museums can work and encourage Gen Z uh, engagement. And then I was hoping we might be able to talk a little bit about what's going on right now with Gen Zs, and um, especially now with the COVID issue. So are you seeing the screen advance? I'm looking at the, you're not. Yeah, there it goes. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, discussion outline. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Yeah. So Gen Z's in a nutshell, we're looking at that 1995 to 2012 range. And on either end of that, we've got some um, transition years where you have, so like I happen to be a millennial who was born in 1983. So I have some characteristics of Gen X because I'm just really close to that demographic. So keep that in mind when you're working with Gen Z's too. They are defined as digital natives. And what that means is that they don't remember a time before the internet. They, most of them had access to devices or tablets before they were, you know, for probably before they were even in school. Um, in some cases, like if your parents maybe did a gender reveal or if they posted baby pictures or a sonogram on their Facebook, then a lot, some of our Gen Zs actually have a digital footprint before they're even born. So that's kind of an interesting thing about them. And looking at how they use digital and technology tools is, is really interesting and it's definitely a strength. They are the most diverse age group on the planet right now. They have the highest number of multi-ethnic and multi-racial um, uh, multi members within their makeup. An interesting statistic is about half, about 50% of Gen Z's actually know someone who uses non-gendered pronouns. So they, there or Z, there. Um, Gen Z's are usually too young to remember 9-11 in a great amount of detail, but they definitely grew up in the shadow of 9-11. They remote, they've, they've seen things in the news. They're very aware of what maybe parents and older siblings were talking about. They're, they have a concern about violence and safety on a national and um, personal scale. They also witnessed the financial crisis in the 2000s. So a lot of them may have been impacted by maybe parents who lost jobs or lost their house. Maybe they had to, they were displaced. Uh, maybe they had older siblings who had to move back in or older family members who moved back into the household. So they're very aware that uh, things like a job and financial security is not something that's guaranteed and it's not something that's permanent. So that's a big anxiety for them. And right now, of course, they are going through COVID-19, which is a difficult time for them. I think because it also plays on some of those anxieties that already exist. Okay, so I'm gonna go into talking about some of their values. So they tend to make a lot of choices and decide what is important by, uh, by their values, just like everybody else does. So the values oftentimes kind of define their motivations. And when asked about what defines happiness or a good life to a Gen Z, they are typically going to explain like these top three things. So top number one is financial security. They are very, very aware of um, the fact that money doesn't buy happiness, but it does give you security and comfortability. If you want to be able to enjoy life, you need to be able to do things like and like be able to pay your bills, health care, 
some of those security. Um, number two is family and friendships. They are very relationally uh, focused. They trust their parents. Uh, they include their parents very actively in their decision-making processes. So when thinking about what college to go to or what jobs to take, like they are using their parents as a, not just a sounding board, but um, one term that I've heard used is co-pilot. So actually using them as a, they trust their opinions very, very deeply. And they're also very influenced by peers. So they are more likely to trust, let's say uh, they want to, they're more likely to take product recommendations from a friend than maybe from like a commercial or an ad they see on social media. So they really like those personal connections and they are more likely to take the opinions and information they get from friends and family than they are from things they read on the internet. Um, and then meaningful work. They are very much driven by a desire to help. We see them volunteering a lot more than millennials did. And they all describe that a happy life or a good life is someone that includes a career that, that allows them to make a positive difference. So they're very altruistic, very empathetic uh, individuals. So when looking at their strengths, I'm looking at sort of the natural gifts that they are, uh, that just by nature of when they were born and some of the things going on in the socioeconomic climate, like some things that just make them, uh, the things they're particularly good at. And a lot of these strengths also relate back to those values. So in the family and friendships category, um, they tend to be very accountable and very responsible because they are focused on those relationships. So if somebody asks you to do something, there's an expectation that it needs to get done. They are uh, uh, very responsible. They don't want to let others down. So they're more likely to follow through with things they say that they're going to do, especially if they know that it's going to benefit someone else. They have a desire to help others. Like we talked about, they're very altruistic. Uh, Diversity is something that is really ingrained in their identity because they are so diverse in their, their own makeup. Um, it's not really something that they have to uh, think about or incorporate. I think a lot of people growing up, they gravitate towards friend groups who, you know, they kind of feel like-minded. They feel like they're in a cohort that is, you know, very similar to their own thinking, their own personality, their own likes, dislikes. Gen Z's are, they have very broad friend groups. They appreciate people with other backgrounds and that's just something that they do naturally. Uh, they also tend to follow authority and rules. They are very, um, like we talked about how they trust the opinions of their parents. They also grew up with a lot of violence and things on television. They were taught at a very early age not to uh, go outside after you know, curfew, like people, they were not allowed to play outside on their own. They were taught, unfortunately, they've seen a lot of school shootings happen and they, they understand that rules are something that provides safety. So they tend to follow rules and processes. And even though that they use social media like constantly, they do crave face-to-face -face authentic relationships. They understand there's a difference between chatting with someone on a screen and actually having a face-to-face -face conversation. And looking at their financial conservative um, strengths, they are very uh, practical and realistic when it comes to money. They understand that money helps buy security and provide for that good life. They are starting to choose colleges based on how to avoid debt. So they're being very conservative in what they, they may choose to do sort of a non-traditional track in college that allows them to work and earn money at the same time as they study. They might choose to go to a smaller local college down the road so that they can stay with their parents and save money on rent and things like that. So that's an interesting thing that we're seeing. Um, this demographic tends to plan for rainy days. A lot of Gen Z's have a savings account before they're even 10 years old. Um, that's something that's kind of new. And not only are they saving, but they're, they're talking about finances. They're very open about financial decisions. Some of that is because their Gen X parents talked about that with talked about finances with them as they were growing up. So they were included in those decisions about the household. So now as they're growing up, they're doing the same. 
they understand that money is security. They, they value that very highly. And, but they will also splurge on things that they feel improves their quality of life. So they are, they are also very likely to get fancy Starbucks coffees. And that is something we see very often. I empathize with that. That's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> but they're also, if you're, if you're looking at how they make some purchasing decisions, like they're more likely to pay certain convenience fees, like to buy something online as opposed to like going to the store and buy it because to them, like that money spent also equates to efficiency and time saved. So it's kind of interesting to see how they make those decisions. They have a strong desire to help. So then they're seeking those authentic relationships. They care about other people they work with and they want real world knowledge and skills. So especially as we start looking at how they engage in museums, how they come in and to our workplace and want to volunteer or intern or employ, um, they want those real world knowledge and skills. So. They do see themselves as leaders. They self-assess themselves very highly on leadership skills. And they are also very self-driven and entrepreneurial, very independent, um, very independent learners. And they do like to work independently. So that is something that we see quite a bit. And of course, the digital natives, like I can't stress enough, like they use technology to communicate and connect like no one else. Um, they aren't necessarily using technology to learn and get information, but they are using it to talk and chat with their friends, with uh, family members. Like that is how they stay connected. They're very adaptable to new technology. Um, I don't know if any of you experienced this, but as soon as we moved into this new Zoom meeting style, I there was a stark contrast between meetings I would have with my colleagues, a lot who are either millennials like me or Gen X or boomers and meetings that I would have with my students. Like there was a lot of confusion amongst the older uh, demographics, but then Gen Z's took to it like ducks to water. Like mm -hmm. in the first five minutes, they were playing with the features. They were doing Zoom backgrounds, like they were joking around and playing with the new tech. So they're very adaptable. They're also literate in visual culture. So I'm thinking about GIFs and memes and some of those things. As an, as an art gallery curator, I'm pretty interested in how they think about those visual communication tools and how they're using them. Um, and I think another thing that's really interesting to see right now is how they use asynchronous communication. So asynchronous communication, what I'm talking about there is Communicating, having conversations, making decisions, conveying information in a non-synchronous uh, way. So in our normal work environment, if we want to make a decision, we all get together in a meeting, we have a discussion, the discussion lasts an hour long, and at the end, we all have a, an understanding of what's going to happen next. With communicating with Gen Zs, they, they text, there are gaps in their communication, they will use different apps to communicate with different people in their friend group at different times. So it's a lot more nebulous. And I think that's something that me as their advisor, and I think a lot of my colleagues are, are kind of getting used to that sort of, it feels more fragmented and it's harder for me to keep up, but for Gen Z, it just comes naturally. And so you asked about what, um, what communication tools we use. They use just about anything that, under the sun. So Snapchat is like made for Gen Z's. That was primarily their first form of social media that they were engaging with. They do not use Facebook and Twitter very much. They may use Facebook to keep up with like uh, older family members, teachers, like I keep up with students on Facebook. Uh, Instagram is interesting because they are using Instagram very carefully and very uh, Privately, they are not using their full names on Instagram. They may be creating separate Instagram accounts and posting different things in different places and sort of curating how their uh, online persona personality is reflected. So they're very adept at how they use these tools differently. TikTok, if you don't know what TikTok is, it is uh, uh, short videos that you can upload. And a lot of those are based on performance. So again, it's not... It's not them, like, it's almost like Instagram and in that they are very carefully curating the, the form of themselves that they're sharing. And again, they're probably not using their name. They're using a username or a 
pseudonym. And then Reddit is someplace where they can do like a deep dive into whatever niche interest they're interest they're into. So um, I my boyfriend has two teenagers, two Gen Zs, and one of them is really into cars. And if he wants to find out anything he wants to know about rotary cars, which I don't know what that is, he can go to Reddit and follow some subreddit and learn whatever he wants to know. Um, YouTube, we kind of understand like you're you're they're using YouTube just the same way as we are. They're following people, they're following uh, celebrities, or they're following how-to videos, uh, like makeup tutorials, or life hacks. Like they're using a lot of YouTube. They use it to follow a lot of gamers. So uh, esports is a big thing with this generation, and Twitch is another social media channel that you may or may not know about. But again, it's it's for esports. So. Gen Z's who are really into um, following professional gamers or gaming themselves, they'll use Twitch and they'll chat with their friends within that those apps too. So all of those things plus more, they're using a lot of GroupMe, group text, video chats, Slack, WhatsApp. And then if they're gamers, they can actually chat in the game and stay connected with their friends there. I wanted to talk a little bit about some things with Gen Z that um, are insecurities because I think these are things where I, as their advisor, am very, I want to be very cautious about and very aware. So again, that financial piece, they are very concerned about being able to find a job. They're very concerned about finding a job that pays enough to live and have that good life that they want. And they're very concerned about debt. They are trying to avoid debt when they go into college. They definitely want to go to college. They definitely want to do things like own a home, own a car, have a family, but they are concerned about how they're going to provide all of those things. Uh, sustainability, they are worried, they are starting to think about choices um, in terms of the products they buy, but also in like maybe the employer they choose to work with. They want to see that the products they choose to buy may be a fuel efficient car or they're buying sustainable food. Um, things that benefit the environment, but also benefit the social environment. So they're making decisions uh, to buy from companies that value equality or ethical human rights practices. Um, and they also worry about violence and what that can do to a community. And we have also seen in a number of cases of anxiety and depression. So if you're on a college campus, like all you have to do is ask one of the professionals in your counseling center, like the number of students who self-report or are diagnosed with anxiety, depression is it's rising. Uh, they feel a lot of pressure to be successful. They are constantly connected on their devices and being without their devices actually creates anxiety. They have this fear of missing out. So we're seeing some mental health issues with our Gen Z too. As their advisor, someone who works with them very closely, I see some other things that I I worry about on their behalf. They, they aren't reporting that this is something they're worried about, but I'm seeing it. Um, they have an intense fear of being wrong or failing. So there tends to be an over-reliance on doing things correctly. So the, rather than being creative and being willing to take a risk, they may just not do it all together. So I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but maybe having a meeting with Gen Z's and like opening it up for a discussion around the table and you might get a lot of just silence. A lot of it is just fear of looking unintelligent in front of their peers. They, they don't wanna say something that could be wrong or, or seem unintelligent. So that's something I try to work with them on, on like building trust and getting them to understand that, okay, so we go, hey, if you make mistakes, I expect you to make mistakes. It's That's what you're here to do. Um, and, it's, and it's not the end of the world if you make a mistake, things like that. They also tend to have an overinflated sense of leadership. So when asked to self-assess on their own level of leadership, 70% uh, actually say that they outperform against their peers on those leadership skills. And that is directly from the Corey C. Miller book that I kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, but 70%, like that math doesn't add up. You can't have 70% outperforming. You know, that's more than the majority. So they tend to have a really high sense of themselves as leaders. So kind of working with them to explain, okay, so you, you have leadership skills, but tell me what that means. Can you demonstrate this? How can we 
how can we put this in a in a way that is applicable and usable for maybe like a resume and thinking about career readiness and things like that. So I kind of wanted to open up and talk with you guys about how museum professionals can help, like leveraging their strengths, offering skills-based training to our Gen Z. How can we attract them to work in museums and galleries based on their desire to make positive change? And how can we include them in professional and programmatic decisions? So um, I know that Brandon, a couple weeks ago, you talked with a group of Gen Z students, which are already involved in your, your museum. Um, I was really excited to hear some of the things they were saying, like um, what sort of programs and things are you guys already doing within your institutions? Do you have internship programs? Do you have um, apprenticeships or volunteer programs? What's going on? Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Seth. Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I have access to the entire student community uh, being right in the middle of campus. So I'm pretty fortunate that and the vast majority of the traditional age students at this point are Gen Z. Uh, but yeah, we, we offer volunteer efforts. We offer work study positions. Uh, the Museum Study Certificate offers internships, currently working with a student now trying to establish an ad distance program. And some of the things, somebody talk about their strengths, especially like their digital skills or digital communication preferences. Uh, my students and Rebecca and I, we've all talked about doing digital takeovers on our social media platforms where the students mm -hmm. can actually take those things over, apply their skills to it and communicate with their peers on really as peer-to-peer -peer agents based on the technological um, leanings that they have. And those are all part of those offerings. I also have students who focus more on, say, social justice issues, who are interested in applying that into an historic space, uh, who might have um, complicated histories dealing with slavery and civil rights and whatnot. And they feel the need to do good work, to do um, really make a difference, and make sure that what they're doing uh, is for a cause. And that's all channeled through a historic space. Um, so yeah, we, we offer all these things, and it's really making the space an active part of a campus community, which at this point is vast majority a Gen Z population. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. At the um, the transportation museum, we have the we have the same offerings that um, that the Gorgas House does, all being part of the same department. So um, we you know we we love volunteers. We have work study positions available. Um, you know, if uh, same same thing with the um, uh, museum studies program. You know, we we're, we're in the process of developing projects that would be geared toward uh, fulfilling that internship requirement. The the complication that we have, um, while we are also a historic. Um, historic institution located in a historic building, we are slightly off of the main campus at UA. And um, so a couple of years ago, the campus overall switched from a, um, a commuter centric um, uh, environment, um, which is what I, I, um, experience campus as I was able to drive my car, park on campus, you know, try to get close to my buildings, you know, all of that. And they switched that a handful of years ago to be more pedestrian focused. So now we've got, you know, bus routes that run on a regular basis. There are, there is still parking on campus, but it's, um, it's, it's centralized in larger decks and the central part of campus is, um, um, really reserved more for faculty and staff, whereas the the students that who um, who drive um, are are being pushed more to the perimeter of campus. Well, we are located um, off main campus, so we're not far, but we're far enough that if you if you don't have a car, if you don't have a bicycle. Um, it may be really, really difficult to get to us. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to actively think about ways to um, where we are a stop on the city bus line, but that's a separate bus line from the campus bus line. So, um, so I've, I've been trying to, to think um, how to, how to make it a little bit easier for uh, students who um, are more inclined to be more strictly pedestrian, how they can get down to us. Brandon is incredibly fortunate. The Gorgas House is um, actually predates campus by a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so I can't, you know, thousands of students walk in front of the Gorgas House every hour during class change. Um, I, 
I, I very, I, I see students when they come down to me specifically for a project, um, if they're history class or journalism class or, you know, anything like that is, um, is encouraged to come down and, and see the museum. We are ecstatic when they come in the doors. We love having them. Um, but I don't have the benefit of heavy traffic um, based on just pure location like um, that Brandon does. But we are absolutely open to um, working with students in as many capacities as we possibly can. Awesome. Mary, I do have a question. Um, mm -hmm. One of your, uh, since since you are um, an, an art art gallery and um, are a lot of your um, exhibitions, do your students pick the topic or the theme? Um, like how, how exactly does the gallery, does the gallery work? And then I've got a follow-up question to, to that based Absolutely. on. Um, so the students that I work with actually do a lot of the curating idea generation. So because we're in a student union, it's a little, it's more of a hybrid program. So we are a gallery within the student union. There are two other professional galleries in this building, but we are not, we are, we work with them. We are partners with them, but we are not affiliated with them. I actually report to the office of student, student programming. And um, so within the Memorial student center, there is a, a group of students who are, they kind of act like a student board, but it's more complicated than that. There's about 19 different student committees and um, chief student leaders from each of those committees actually get together to approve, deliberate, and um, help improve others' programs throughout the course of the year. So all of our exhibits actually go through that process. Mm -hmm. So they are actually being looked at and vetted by students who maybe they're in a committee that does um, plans a conference on national affairs or they're in the Latinx uh, cultural committee, like, or they're in an international committee. Like they have a lot of different interests. So as we are preparing our exhibition ideas, we have the benefit of getting a lot of input and diverse opinions, but sometimes it does feel like we are trying to sort of advocate and explain things that would be more commonly known if, if we were in a traditional gallery type of setting. So the students come up with the, the programming ideas and they it usually, so it's kind of messed up right now because of COVID-19, but normally we would have had all of our ideas for the 2020, 2021 year. So next fall and spring decided and approved in April. So they do about a year out and then next year's team is in charge of implementing all of those exhibits. So they've done things like um, in the past past year, we did a couple of exhibits based on campus history. So there was, if you want to look at our website, there's actually a whole list of all the exhibits we've planned because I know I'm going to forget something really cool. But they did an exhibition about Matthew Gaines, who was the first black uh, senator in Washington County, which is a county close to Brazos Valley, or where we are. And um, there's been a campaign for, gosh, 25 years to try and get Matthew Gaines memorialized on our campus. And for whatever reason, it has been pushed to, uh, um, there's, they're in the fundraising process now, but it has just taken a long time to get there. So the students were interested in that. We wanted to support that student initiative and so we did a whole exhibit about the life and history and legacy of Matthew Gaines. Um, they've done other exhibits based on uh, architecture on campus. So we have quite a few historic buildings. And so we did a photography, uh, worked with a photographer who had recently published a book with our university press. So we had uh, photographs of campus buildings here in the gallery and then did a companion walking tour so you could go around and see those buildings on campus. They've done a lot with um, social justice. Uh, I think the Gen Zs that I've had in the past, well, since I've been here, have been very interested in, uh, it's that desire to help, it's that interest in um, making a difference in their community. So we've done exhibits about immigration, we've done exhibits about recycling, we've done exhibits about um, Things that they really care about. We've, we've tackled sexual assault. We've tackled, uh, talked about mental health quite a bit. We've uh, talked about, um, we did a show last year that was photography and then personal stories from transgendered Aggies. And um, so they've done quite a bit in those types of 
topics that they it's more like they have this topic they want to talk about they really care about and then we work together to figure out okay so how can we turn this into an art exhibit where's the artistic piece where's the visual piece that we can kind of work with this social content that you want to talk about very cool and um whenever they uh, whenever the students have, well, like your your juried show that we that we see um, behind you, do you happen to see when the when the students have the ability to and the opportunity to kind of, um, I guess, cre- you know, create their own artworks in a juried show that maybe doesn't have a specific theme or the theme is very 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 broad? Do mm-hmm. you happen to see some of those insecurities? Um, that they they think about and they face kind of come out a bit more strongly in their in their artworks when they're when they're given the freedom to do so. Like, is that something that you kind of see happen in a more tactile fashion? Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Um, we did a show maybe two years ago called called Aggie Mind, and it was open to submissions from even on campus and all of the pieces we just ask the students to submit something that reflects their own idea of mindfulness mental health um personal uh their their personal experience with those kinds of topics and so yeah we definitely see that coming through their artwork quite a bit um the show behind me is always a lot of fun because we get more than a hundred pieces donated. So as you can kind of see, we've set it up salon style. There are prizes for the top winning artists. We have faculty and other art gallery professionals come in and do the judging. So it's a big deal every year we do this. Uh, so, but yeah, we definitely see, we definitely see the mental health issues and insecurities coming out in the artwork. It's a big part of their expression. So it's gonna, it's gonna come out there. I was just I was just curious. I have I have a little bit of a background in the um, art art gallery scene postgraduate school too. Uh, whereas mine mine wasn't as um, as contemporary, but um, but having uh, worked in that environment for two years, I I kind of just find myself naturally veering to mm-hmm. that that uh, that frame of thought. Um, how many? Um, So I'm having to quickly, I'm having to quickly read my, my questions real quick. So how many um, times do you coordinate with faculty um, to have faculty pieces that, um, you know, incorporated into the shows that may, you know, just kind of help drive forward the the point or the theme that your students are trying to, to portray? So we get a lot of, um, we are encouraged to work with faculty quite a bit. So I always try to include faculty if we have an artist coming in. I always try to include faculty by asking them, hey, do you want to bring your class to come in and we'll do an artist talk here in the gallery? And those go over really well. Um, we have faculty who will come in and teach workshops just for our own membership, for our own students. Those those are also really popular. And it's a big draw. Like students will join the committee just to have access to those opportunities. Um, let's see what else. Um, I recently, I did a, I had a guest a uh, class come in from our MFA program, it's a professional artist training program, and they wanted to get some information and talk to somebody about how to work with galleries as professional artists. So I'm, I'm interested in doing more things like that too. That's fantastic. That's yeah. that's all awesome. Uh, Brandon, do you have um do you have a question that you want to uh, that you want to tuck in here? Yeah, sure. I've got a, I've got a few. Uh, you know, hearing what you talk about the space and whatnot, I think it's important that we, as professionals who work on in an academic environment, create spaces for students to express themselves, whether it be in a historic space like the Transportation Museum or the Gorgas House, or one that's focused more on art. Um, you know, we work with students who've done historic themed exhibits, historic themed uh, you know, photography installations, doing individual projects. So I think it's really important to uh, really stress how important it is to have these physical spaces for students uh, mm-hmm. to really express themselves and deal with the issues that they're focusing on. So kind of following along those lines, can you tell us about some of the most memorable exhibitions um, that you've that you've helped put on? Uh, what really stands out about those? Um, the space itself. So, like, I, I kind of want to filter this question based on what you were talking about with getting the students into your space. So, yes, you want to create that uh, welcoming environment. Uh, in our gallery, in particular, we are really fortunate because 
you're facing me this way, but on the, the wall I'm facing is all windows. So we face a hallway where people walk by, they see what's inside from the windows and they're drawn into it. So we like to do things that have a lot of color that are really eye attracting because it really just invites people in. Like it's, it's it sounds really simple, but uh, if they see it through the glass and they think it's interesting, they'll walk in. Um, but we also try to do things that cater to those issues that the, the students care about. So we do find that we get a lot of our traffic from uh, word of mouth. So we know that students are listening to their professors or listening to their friends. So if we can get a faculty member to either bring their class in or talk to uh, or maybe just encourage their students to come in for extra credit or or encourage their students to, um, oh, hold on, I lost my train of thought, the screen popped up now. So um, we're, we're looking at ways that we can work with faculty and getting more um, recommendations for people to come into the museum. So I did think about other ways we could use space. Um, I think something, we also have connected to us is another gallery space that I talked about the, in our building. We're connected by a wall with a, a doorway. And in their space, they actually have like movable bean bags, which it's kind of a problem right now because of COVID. We've removed all of the interactive pieces, all the touch objects, all the soft surfaces, but that is a space that the students really loved and enjoyed. Like they would go in there to study. They could move the bean bags around and work with their friends. Like I think even in a historic house or any kind of museum or institution like that, you can create those spaces where students feel invited and welcomed uh, and they'll use it. Like they, you might have to adapt a little bit your expectations of what they do in your space, but just allowing them the flexibility to come in and use the space, I think is a big, a, a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great response and it's something that we've experienced. It's, so you have this, this, you know, building that's 190 years old, but you have a younger generation that needs to make their own meaning in that space. So how can you reinterpret it, reimagine it for this younger generation to really use? Because it is a cultural resource and it belongs to everyone. So how, what, are, that's a challenge. So how do you actually manage that? So um, how many students would you say are involved each semester? How many visitors do you have coming in and out? I have seven students who are in the leadership team, so they have dedicated roles. We have a graphics student who does all of our signage in the, in the gallery. We have a, an external development per, uh, student who actually helps make partnerships and like reach out to faculty and, and um, do some of our outreach that way. And then we have, so everyone has their own sort of designated role. But then outside of that, we have anywhere from 10 to about 15 just general members. And we, our membership, is very flexible. So we have some members who all they do is show up to the workshops and that's it, we never see them. Some will come to you know every other meeting and um, some are more involved in that. And we, we kind of look at that throughout the year and encourage people to come as much as they can because that membership base will eventually be our leadership group for next year. So we, we kind of keep it flexible because we know that, well, Gen Zs are very busy people. They are usually working on schoolwork. They probably have, well, we know they've got this organization. They might have something else. And a lot of them have a part-time job or something on the side because they're trying to make money. So we try to work within those other uh, interests and other, uh, other things that take up their time to kind of give them the most flexibility with working with us. Hey, there's no one there. Go ahead, Catherine, please. Oh, I, I was just going to say, do you, do you, because Gen Z are, they're, they're so focused on, on the online, um, you know, mm -hmm. the online environment and whatever, whatever platform or capacity they, they may, that, that may take form. Do you feel like uh, as, as museums try to look to the future, do you feel like there is the possibility or threat that physical spaces will become less important as we move to the future because there's such a focus on um, on the the connectivity of the uh, and the flexibility of having something in your hands like do you feel like the physical spaces are um, do you feel like they're in danger of becoming um, becoming obsolete becoming moot at some point I think now, one opinion question. <laughs> I think that's a really good question. And I think it's a really relevant question right now because of 
we're all in quarantine, we're all stuck at home. We're all working from home. So I think the physical space is definitely still important. We are seeing a lot of people who are really desperate for connectivity right now. They're using social media to reach out and connect with others, but what they really want is to be able to go out and meet with people uh, and be in different spaces. So yeah, I, I don't see the physical space ever becoming uh, insignificant. But it's, it's definitely, um, I, th I think we're all going to figure out exactly how adaptable um, museums yeah. in particular are um, coming out of coming out of this situation and um, especially as we all uh, look look to the future. Um, so um, yeah, I just I, I just wondered what your what your thoughts thoughts were thoughts were on that. So. I think there's there's a lot of learning that is still going to happen as we kind of navigate the next few months and maybe even longer. I know uh, I've seen quite a few things at other museums that are doing virtually, whether it's uh, like virtual tours or like one of the first things we did when we when our campus closed was we put our Art Fest exhibit online and put it in a format where people can click through. Um, but it's not the same as being there. It really isn't. So students, I think, will still want that uh, physical connection when they when they start returning to classes, whenever that happens. I, I think that's something that museums have been, um, it, it's a question and a concept that museums have been thinking about for a couple of years, oh, yeah. actually. You know, if you put too much online, does that encourage people to come to your physical yeah. space or could it possibly deter them because, you know, they if they can look at it from the comfort of their couch, why get up? You know, why put on pants when you can <laughs> see the master, um, you know, these wonderful well, pieces, artifacts from the comfort of your home? You know, so I, I think that's something that museums have been thinking about for a lot longer than um, than might be, uh, you know, might be readily, readily um, evident. Yes, um, I think, well, what you guys are doing with the museums from home, like putting these discussions, I think having things more like, um in-depth artist conversations, or you could do virtual workshops. You can do a lot with the online tools that we already have. So I, I don't think that lessens the accessibility to the museum. Um, it does maybe have fewer people coming into your space, but you're still providing that service. You're still providing that meaningful content to your followers and your, your students. So I don't see that as I mean, yes, I, I want people to come into the gallery and when we have special events and receptions and things, we obviously want people in here. But I also see that the things that we can do online are also making an impact. So mm -hmm. I think it's just so, hard for us to track what that impact is. So you can like look at how many people have logged into your video or you can look at how many people clicked on the thing, but you don't know what sort of reaction they're having or that kind of that I think is really the difficult thing for museums. Yeah, I, I think I, I would agree with that because so so frequently we're we're focused on you know our our visitor numbers, how many people are crossing the threshold, how many people are in our spaces, and um, by introducing this um, entire new world that is is online, you know what are the best ways to, to calculate that? How can we calculate that? How can we show investors, um, grant committees, um, you know, uh, anybody who could be a funding source, you know, how can we show our engagement? Um, Cause it, you know, it used to be, oh, we had 5,000 visitors in six months, you know, and that's wonderful because we're up, you know, 25%, you know, it's, it's, you know, all of that kind of, um, you know, analytical um, analytical discussion is, is is shifting and is changing. Um, sure. And so. and we're we're a free admission gallery. Uh, other places that require an admission, like they are definitely wanting those that foot traffic. So it is an issue. I feel, yeah. Renan, do you have? Um, I, we might have uh, time for one one more one more discussion. Do you have a question or anything that you'd like to? Like just hang out. Mary and I could talk all day. I mean, we know each other. Uh, we, we could talk. Sure, all day. that's no. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, I'm gonna have. To, I'm gonna ask this because I would be remiss if I didn't do it. Uh, and I think it can kind of show the, the strengths of and the different um, like nonlinear paths to get into like museum or gallery work. Mm -hmm. um, but both uh, both of you study at the University of Le Leicester. Leicester, I'm gonna say that. Uh, even though it has even though it has a C in it. Um, can you both? Tell us what that experience was like and how it may differ or be similar to studying the United States or the challenges there. Uh, really, what was that experience? And I'm going to defer to Mary because she actually spent a lot more time working in the UK post uh, graduate school than I did. So, Mary, take it away. 
Um, I wanted to do my master's overseas because uh, after after my undergrad, I, I really just wanted something different. I was kind of burnt out. I was over the whole school thing and I just wanted something completely different. So I was looking at specific grad programs that were um, museum studies related. And um, the University of Leicester is one of one of like a preeminent institution for museum studies. It's one of the first research institutions that did a lot of research based on museum studies. So uh, that's kind of where I ended up because of at the time, this was like in 2006. So um, I was going to my library in my career center to find out about which, you know, colleges and grad schools I was I could apply for. So um, that's how I ended up at Leicester, though. Yeah, I um I I was trying. I actually was um was interested in Baylor. Uh, there's a museum studies um program at Baylor, and um my GRE score was not high enough. Um, I do not standardize test well. I uh, freely and readily admit that. And um, in researching other places, um, when basically when my mom gave me the green light that I could actually leave the country and she was okay with that, um, I did, uh, you know, expanded my my research uh, limits and uh, found Lester. And uh, one of the things I loved about them was there was no entrance test you know, um, that, that was not a, a factor of admission. And it was more, um, you know, what, um, you know, what it was more, it seemed more effort-based and I thought, Oh, huh, um, I can, I can fill a lot of those requirements. And then I thought, and it's in England. I have always wanted to spend more time in England. So, um, and uh, hadn't missed the uh, the deadline to apply for that fall semester, which was even more shocking to me as well. I thought I was going to have to take a year off. And uh, so I, again, I submitted my information and um, they uh, they accepted me. And um, I graduated in uh, from UA in May of 2006. And at the end of September, I was in England um, to begin my graduate program and met Mary uh, within the first couple of days that uh, we were there. We lived at the same um, we lived at the same house. We lived in this gorgeous Edwardian home that had been converted to uh, student residences. And we were lucky enough to be placed on the same floor a couple of doors down. And um, yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. But um, yeah. That's, yeah. Well, well, really cool. Back. Thanks for sharing that, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I think we have a few minutes left. So, uh, Mary, I was going to give you a chance to uh, sort of uh, go over your sources uh, today that uh, that you shared with us, if you wanted to, and and give you the opportunity to plug anything that you want to. And uh, so, uh, let us know if there are any any other thoughts that you uh, wanted to share before we wrap up. So, uh, what you're seeing on the screen, the Corey C. Miller book. She this is not her only book on Gen Z. She's done quite a few research and. Um, studies and books on the topic. So definitely look her up if you're interested in Gen Z's. Uh, Sarah Weiss did a, wrote a book called Instabrain, uh, specifically about marketing to Gen Z's, which was really interesting. A lot of the social media stuff that I kind of talked about, I've, I've learned from there as well as from my Gen Z students. Um, Jean Twang uh, wrote one of the first books about Gen Z's. It was published in 2017, which is relatively new. At the time, we were referring to Gen Z's as iGen. So her book is kind of interesting if you want sort of a uh, look at where we started with this conversation. I didn't get to talk about it, but the NACE studies on career readiness, uh, I think is really important. And if you are working with interns or early young employees who are Gen Z's, look at if you can rewrite your job description or help them write their resumes to craft their experience from your museum to fit some of the in the NACE study standards on career readiness. NACE stands for the National Association of Colleges and Employers, and they do a lot of research on the skills that students come out of college with and the skills that employers are looking for and where are those gaps. So if you can kind of help your students understand that, okay, this experience is helping you get these sort of skill sets that an employer is looking for, I think that's great. Um, and then the Pew Research Center does quite a lot of generational research as well. You can look them up and that's where I got that first graphic that I used. So um, yeah, I'm also, if you wanna talk with me, like I, I am not a researcher. I, I read a lot of other people's stuff and I work with this demographic, but I don't do my own independent research. I don't do surveys and I don't do assessments, but um, if you are interested in talking or learning more or even just comparing notes, like I would love to hear from you. 
Fantastic. Yeah, that was great. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you, Mary, for uh, joining us today. And uh, I guess we did have one comment uh, before we go about uh, Discord. Uh, so I know you talked about uh, different platforms and, and ways that uh, Gen Z is communicating. Uh, I, I also have heard a lot about Discord that I haven't investigated as of yet, uh, but that does seem to be very popular. So I just wanted to throw that in before we got out of here. All right. Well, I think that's uh, going to do it for this Museums from Your Home live stream. We'll be uh, doing this every day, uh, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. And I'll just throw up this uh, website here, museums.ua.edu uh, slash museums from your home. If you have any questions about our live stream schedule or where to watch, or if you want to watch uh, some of our previous archived live streams like Mary talked about with Brandon and his students at the Gorgas House, you can watch all of those things there. We also have links to all of our educational material there from Discovering Alabama and the Alabama Museum of Natural History and Mountville Archaeological Park. You can find all of that information there. If you're liking uh, what we're doing here and you want to support UI Museums, you can do that by going to give.ua.edu slash museums. Uh, that uh, gives you the opportunity to become a supporting member. Uh, also want to remind people we are on YouTube. So uh, Mary talked about YouTube as a, a platform for Gen Z. Uh, if you want to uh, subscribe and keep up with all of our video content that we're putting out, uh, you'll find all of our live streams there. We also have uh, video series like our isolation observations, which Brandon has been a part of and Catherine as well. And uh, we also have a, a Moundville Mondays video series that we've started to give you a behind the scenes look at Moundville. So all that stuff is there at youtube.com slash museums. And uh, I guess that will do, will do it for everything in terms of uh, covering all of our museums from your home uh, content. And so I guess uh, we'll wrap up and say thank you, Mary, once again for joining us and, and to Brandon and Catherine for uh, moderating the discussion. And I guess that will do it. So thank you to everybody who is watching with us and who will watch this later. And thank you for visiting UA Museums from your home. Hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, y'all.